want to introduce uh, Tom Barkin. Um, uh, Tom is the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. He's held this position since uh, 2018. He serves on the Fed's chief monetary policy body, um, the Federal Open Market Committee, and he is responsible for bank supervision and the Federal Reserve's uh, technology organization and operations as well. He's on the ground um, in the Fed's fifth district, uh, which covers South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, DC, West Virginia, and Maryland. Prior to joining the Richmond Fed, Tom was a senior partner and CFO at McKenzie and Company. And um, he earned his bachelor's, MBA, and JD from Harvard. So with that, Tom, I will uh, let you take the podium. Yeah. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining today. I, I really regret that I was not at the forecast dinner, because I'd like to meet whoever predicted inflation correctly last year. <laughs> And I'm really curious on what he or she thinks it's going to be this year. So we'll have some Q&A uh, after my talk. And if anyone has any points of view, I'm all ears. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk for 10 minutes and then uh, and take anything that's on your mind. Uh, but I thought I might start. The Fed's been in the news uh, a lot, especially over the last week or so. So I thought I might just talk about what's put us in the news, uh, which is interest rates. <laughs> I have to warn you, I'm going to give you just my views and not anybody else's views. So I wouldn't necessarily trade on them, but I just want to make sure you know that you're just hearing from me. Um, so last week, the FOMC decided to take interest rates up 25 basis points. Uh, in our statement, we said ongoing uh, increases in the target range will be appropriate in order to return inflation to our objective, which is 2%. Uh, the median member of the FOMC forecasted seven rate hikes this year and three to four next year, which would move rates modestly over what most of my colleagues would estimate as the neutral rate. In his press conference, Jay said that we would also start to reduce the size of our balance sheet at a coming meeting, which he said could be as early as the next meeting, which is in May. I would just say I think it's time to normalize rates. Um, the worst of the pandemic is behind us. Uh, we're 22 months into the fastest recovery in our history. Uh, by the end of this quarter, GDP is uh, going to exceed the pre-pandemic level. It's probably also going to exceed its pre-pandemic trend line. Consumer spending is strong. Business investment is healthy. The housing market is hot. Underlying demand looks like it's going to remain robust, fueled by uh, very healthy business balance sheets, extremely robust personal balance sheets, the need to replenish low inventories, and state governments that are flush with cash. We may well see more variants, per possibly the one that's rising in Western Europe today, but I think we're learning to live with COVID. Our challenge today is now different. It's inflation. As demand for goods exploded in the middle of the pandemic, supply chains struggled to keep up. Labor markets also became quite tight. Unemployment is now 3.8%, which is, of course, historically low. In addition, the pool of those looking for a job has shrunk. Two million fewer workers are in the workforce, and immigration remains well below COVID, but uh, below its pre-COVID trend. As a consequence, wages are up. Average hourly earnings have risen 5.1%, and price inflation is elevated, with core PCE at 5.2%. That's the highest since April 1983. Now, at first, these conditions seem temporary, but they've persisted and they've broadened which makes inflation, of course, the headline of the day and causing more and more firms to consider raising their own prices. So all of this means the economy is no longer in need of aggressive Fed support. Instead, we need to put ourselves in position to contain inflation. And that's, of course, our job. The Fed's mandate is to requires us to promote stable prices. Now, you might be uh, skeptical or you might wonder how raising rates is going to contain inflation. And I would just say the answer is different over different time horizons. Now, short term, uh, inflation tends to be driven by causes that are largely outside of the Fed's control. I like to think about the aftermath of a hurricane. Um, if a hurricane comes through a coastal town, lumber prices are going to increase because demand's going to spike for materials to rebuild people's homes. An interest rate rise the day after a hurricane isn't going to affect that dynamic either on the demand or the supply side or the price side. And nor should it try to, because those price movements are going to correct themselves 
once the buildings are repaired. And of course, I want to use this analogy to talk about the pandemic because we're still working through the destructive impact that was caused by the pandemic and of course now geopolitics. Inflation continues to be affected by supply chain shortages, low labor force participation, and the ebb and the flow of the virus, most recently in China. And Russia's invasion of the Ukraine has affected prices of commodities like energy and nickel and aluminum and wheat. So that's the short term. Uh, in the medium and long term, however, you know, what the Fed does really does matter. Um, Milton Friedman did a famous analysis you've all heard of that showed that monetary policy operates, operates well, but operates with a lag, which he called long and variable. And we influence inflation in two ways, one tangible and one intangible. So let me talk about the tangible. Um, in a world of stable inflation expectations, we raise rates, that reduces demand. Demand drops, that reduces prices. How does that happen? Deposit rates increase, which creates more incentive to save rather than spend. The dollar appreciates, which lessens demand for exports and lowers the price of imports. Borrowing rates rise, reducing capital investment and consumer spending. That's particularly true in interest-sensitive sectors like housing, auto, and consumer durables. You're already seeing mortgage rates go up, for example. Now, on the intangible side, uh, monetary policy operates through what I'll call a psychological effect, and it happens over the longer term. Uh, individuals and firms build up expectations about future inflation. Firms then make their pricing and their compensation decisions, and individuals make their employment and their purchase decisions in the context of those expectations. If the Fed does our part to control inflation, expectations and prices and wage increases stay stable and anchored. If they don't, as you might argue has been happening in a place like Turkey, they don't. Now happily, at least so far, as best we can tell, inflation expectations remain stable. If you look at the TIPS uh, metrics, they're very much still in line with our 2% target, despite short-term inflation and short-term inflation expectations at multi-decade highs. If you look at survey metrics like the Michigan survey of five to 10 year inflation expectations, they've only increased modestly. Both of those metrics are at 2013 and 2014 levels. Now, some of you may worry that raising rates is necessarily gonna drive the economy into a recession. And with the surge of energy prices since the Ukrainian in invasion, some are even raising the topic of stagflation, a word we, most of us have not used since the 70s. Now, the rate path we announced last week shouldn't drive economic decline. We're still far from the level of rates uh, that constrains the economy. Uh, as an estimate of that, my colleagues on the FOMC would think that's somewhere in the 2 to 3 percent range. This week's move would still leave us 9 to 10 rate increases away from the level that would constrain the economy, the neutral rate. So instead of thinking about the upcoming cycle of rate increases as foreshadowing a coming recession, Think of it instead as an indication that the extraordinary support of the pandemic era is unwinding. We're reducing that support gradually so we can get back to a more normal position as the economic situation evolves. And then, and only then, we can decide if we need to put the brakes on the economy or not. On the other side, prior to the meeting, there was a lot of debate about whether the Fed should move faster. And we have moved at 50 basis point clips in the past, and we certainly could do so again, especially if we start to believe it's necessary to prevent inflation expectations from unanchoring. But setting the right pace for uh, rate increases is an art. It's a balancing act. Um, we normalize rates to contain inflation, but if we overcorrect, we can negatively impact employment, which is the other part of our dual mandate. And we have some time to get to a neutral position. Inflation and employment are still being heavily influenced by geopolitics and pandemic era factors. Um, and so it's just gonna take us a while for us to understand and meet the dynamics of the post-pandemic economy. Ben Bernanke said when he joined the Board of Governors in 2003 that monetary policy is a collaborative exercise. Clear communication and steady movement guide markets in ways that reinforce our messaging. In contrast, market surprises sometimes lead to tighten financial conditions that can cause the real economy to pull back more than we intend. So it's worth noting that the bond market seems to be taking our direction. As we've signaled a rate change over the last several months, market rates have moved significantly. The two-year treasury was 28 basis points at the end of September. It's 218 today. The five-year was 98 basis points at the end of September. 
it's 2.39 uh, today. So while we could move faster, we're already having more impact than you might think. Now, while the proven and more important tool is rates, I want to spend a second and talk about balance sheet, because I think our balance sheet moves also reinforce this rate path. As a reminder, we started purchasing treasuries and mortgage-backed securities in March of 2020, first in an effort to uh, make markets function, and then second to support the economy through the pandemic. Our balance sheet was $4.2 trillion two years ago. It's $9 trillion today. So as we start to normalize rates, it's also appropriate to start to normalize the balance sheet, and we'll begin to do that soon. What's the impact of that? Uh, I'll just say if you read the economic literature, you won't come to any conclusion because it's incredibly wide ranging. But for me, it's pretty simple. I think if we're in the market buying assets, that depresses yields. And if we're in the market reducing assets, that's going to increase yields. I don't think either one of them is nearly as big an impact as most uh, economic forecasters seem to think and even as markets may seem to think. I think it's a modest impact, but I think it is a real impact. And so we'll have that symmetric impact. And luckily, Reducing the balance sheet at a time where we're raising rates uh, are simpatico. I mean, those two things work together. So what are you keeping an eye on? What should I keep an eye on in the coming months? Um, I don't want to be trite, but I think it's supply, demand, and pricing. I think all of them are going to normalize, right? But there are a lot of unanswered questions here. On the demand side, you know, it, it should calm down as rates increase, excess savings are spent, particularly for those less fortunate, and we work through the current uh, oil price shocks. But how much will it come down? How quickly? And what will be the mix of goods and services? Supply should recover as COVID recedes, supply chains are remediated, and workers rejoin the workforce. But how long is this going to take? And how much upside does the labor force have? Inflation should move toward target as pandemic and geopolitical pressures ease and policy normalizes. But how fast will that happen? And what's going to be the impact of this period of elevated inflation on inflation expectations? It's actually interesting to look at the chart of the last 40 years, where you see basically 39 years of 2% inflation and one year of 5.5% uh, inflation. And those people who say we're into a new era have to argue against the last 39 years. And those people who say it's going to bounce back to 2% have to think long and hard about how did we get to 6% all of a sudden. Um, I think the answers to these questions are going to dictate the pace uh, with which we use our tools. Um, another way to put it is we're going to get ongoing feedback about how we need to adjust policy in order to keep our job, inflation expectations anchored, and keep inflation on a medium-term path uh, to our 2% target. So I hope it was just a useful way to put on the table the topic lots of us are, are thinking about. And I'm more than happy to take any comments, questions, insights. Uh, and to hear from last year's forecasting winner. <laughs> I, I yeah, Ashley. So wage inflation is at a multi-year high right now. So do you expect that per, to persist? And, and if so, how do you incorporate that into like, rate hikes in the future as well? Well, one thing I've been pondering a lot lately is, um, is this wage thing temporary or is it permanent? The case for temporary, which has been made you know, very broadly by many people, including me, um, you know, relates around retirees leaving the workforce and people not being able to get childcare or schools being closed and stimulus payments or other savings in people's pockets, uh, funding them not returning to the workforce. Uh, but I think you have to look long and hard at a different uh, conversation now, which I'd, I'd say uh, the following. Uh, labor's been long for 30 years. Uh, that's a combination of the baby boomers going into the labor market. Uh, women working in the workforce at higher uh, rates, immigration being robust, people being healthier and living longer. And in the context of uh, offshoring and, out, you know, and outsourcing, in the context of labor being long, I think businesses made a lot of choices. Um, some of them are obvious, like cutting pensions or you know, wages not being quite as, uh, increasing quite as much. Some of them less obvious, like you know, relying on outsourcers, because you always felt labor was going to be there, and so you could depend on someone else to do it. A lot of demographers have been forecasting that that era would end. Um, and if you look at the baby boom demographic numbers, for example, they start to go the other way about 10 years ago. But in the last very long upturn, we really didn't see this kind of pressure in the labor market, in part because participation went up significantly. OK, so now we're on the back end of this. Uh, participation is still lower than it was, so maybe it'll come up. But I think we have to put on the table the question of whether 
this period we've had over the demographic trend line isn't, uh, isn't real, but is actually the aberration. And that today isn't the aberration, but is actually real. And so if we're going into a world where labor is going to be short over the next X years, that's going to be a very different uh, environment. And the case for labor being short would include demographics, would include deep globalization, and so access to offshore labor pools uh, might be lower. It would include people reassessing you know, their lives, but you could imagine how that could have happened uh, out of the last couple years. And in particular, when you see this large group of retirees <coughs> retire, you know, the odds of them coming back in the workplace, at least historically, aren't that good. And so I think, you know, we may well be walking into a place where labor is going to be tight and that will be wage pressure for some time. Now, you know, markets move and so uh, as wages go up, that should bring more people in. Uh, as wages go up, that should incent businesses to invest in things like automation and, and productivity. So they will, e you know, we'll get to equilibrium uh, over time. But I, I do imagine we're going to have pressure for some time. Okay, I got a lot of questions. Yeah. I'd like to ask about the shape of the yield curve. And um, you know, as we sit today, the five year treasury and the 10 year note just have inverted slightly. Uh, the two year, uh, the 10 year is rapidly, uh, the spread is rapidly declining now, just about 20 basis points. Is the Fed willing and does the Fed like the idea of continuing to raise rates and enforcing an inverted yield curve? Yeah, so why don't I answer the question you didn't ask is what, what's it all about here? So if anyone here understands the yield curve, I'm all ears. Um, uh, I think I understand the short end of the yield curve. I mean, we've talked about a rate path. I think the short end of the yield curve is responding to that rate path. Um, uh, there are times where that front end of the yield curve takes us on the rate path and then takes us a little bit down, right? That might be, you know, we control inflation and come back down, or it might be there's a recession, whatever version of that. But I think I kind of understand the signals from the short end of the yield curve. I actually don't understand the long end of the yield curve at all. I mean, if you look at the 10-year tips, I think 10-year tips, uh, maybe this is two days ago, were like 298. The 10-year bond was, you know, a break, break even inflation. 10-year bond was, so, you know, real rates over 10 years are low. And it's hard to figure out how they, you know, get to that. My conclusion has been that the long end of the yield curve is being driven by stuff that's unrelated to what we're doing. It's being driven by global flows of funds. And in a world where you've still got, you know, trillions mm -hmm. of dollars of negative yielding debt in countries like Japan and Germany and Switzerland that have a lot of savers, I think money is flowing from one place to another. And that's just keeping the long end low. That's true during times that are robust, think 2018. That's true there are times that are not that robust, and that's true uh, right now. So I don't take much signal at all from the 10-year, because it's, it's just the one place you're going to put your money uh, in a safe haven situation, and I just think money's flowing there. And I'm told that, and I haven't looked at this in the last month or so, but I was told a month ago that actually the carry trade into that was you know, immediately profitable if you were in Switzerland or Germany. And so I just think that's what's, what's keeping it down. Um, some of my colleagues care about it a lot and some of it don't, I think, is the answer. And you can listen to people's uh, comments. Um, you know, I think what's hard, even if you disbelieved everything I said, right, you said, no, that's ridiculous, markets are brilliant, they understand everything, and the yield curve is telling us something, then is it telling you that we're going to control inflation, everything's going to be great, or are they telling you we're headed into a recession? I mean, you actually can't go through the year by year and figure out which of those it is. So I, I can't take much out of it other than, you know, the, the reaction of the long end of the curve to our rate increases is not nearly what academic theory would suggest. That's, that's what I take out of it. Yeah? Uh, you said a neutral level for rates was 2 to 3%. What do you think a, uh, a neutral level is for the balance sheet? Well, uh, first point, that would be the range of estimates of my colleagues. Um, and those of you who've studied the neutral letter, le uh, level of rates would know that the error bounds around that are so significant that it makes you wonder why we talk about it. But that's, uh, uh, that is what my colleagues would estimate between two and three. Uh, so I think personally, I don't know if it's neutral um, because um, if you believe that the balance sheet has any rate a yield impact than any level of balance sheet has a yield impact. And then if you go to zero, so I mean, I, I don't see it so much as a, 
uh, a car that you took your foot off the gas or the brakes. But I do think the appropriate level for the balance sheet uh, is the level where we can operate with ample reserves, which we sort of tested the line of that the last time in 20, September 2019. Um, at the time, September 2019, I think it was about a trillion three um, was reserves. That's not the balance sheet, that's reserves. And then I think you could add another two and a half trillion for currency and the treasury account and the rest. But reserves, it was about a trillion three. Of course, the system's grown, the world's grown, but you know, put it in the high single digit trillions. <laughs> One trillion eight one nine. That that's probably uh, you know I think where you'd get in reserves, where you would be at the level of ample reserves, but you'd have the minimum that you need to operate, somewhere like that. Yeah, up in the back. Thank you. Yeah, and I mentioned, you know, stagflation earlier. A reminder, you know, at least I think of stagflation, I remember it, uh, mm -hmm. as uh, low growth and high inflation, right? So we're, that's not where we are today. I mean, where we are now is high growth and high inflation. And that is different and fundamentally different. And in particular, for our levers, it's different. Because if you have high growth and high inflation, there's no trade-off between our levers. You increase rates because you want to dampen growth and you want to dampen inflation. It gets harder when you have stagflation because then you've got, you know, if you increase rates, you make the GDP, uh, which it goes, you know, we're not growing, you then put it into shrinkage and you bring inflation down. And that's what they struggle with in the mid-70s until Volcker kind of decisively decided to tackle it with, uh, with what he did. Um, and that could always happen, but I think that's not, I just, underlying demand is very strong. And a few numbers that I might just throw out there. Um, uh, you've all heard probably the excess savings number. It's still two and a half trillion. We've now had one month since the crisis started where we spent under the pre-crisis savings rate. And so that's 23 months of excess savings that have still not gone spent. So that's a consumer savings uh, uh, stimulus still to come. You know, we know the six trillion the government's in, a lot of it hasn't been put into the economy yet. Uh, net worth, I saw a number that net worth in this country is up 32 trillion from what it was uh, pre-COVID. Now, uh, a lot of that's not liquid because it's, um, you know, in, your, in the markets or it's in your house. You could subtract the two and a half trillion I just talked about, that still leaves you 30 trillion. Now it's more held by the um, wealthy than the less wealthy because they tend to hold, you know, assets. Uh, but if you're selling expensive watches, that's probably pretty good for that part uh, of the economy. So both of those are big. A business balance sheet's extremely healthy. Personal balance sheet's extremely healthy. Bank balance sheet's extremely healthy. Um, and uh, just wander around a state house these days and look at how much money uh, they have that they're trying to figure out how to spend or cut taxes on. And so I think in state after state after state, you're seeing that amount of fiscal stimulus is going to come into the economy as well. So, you know, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be strong. Consumer sentiment is very low right now. I think that's very purely inflation. Um, uh, there's lots of wild cards in the geopolitical situation. You know, I don't even want to think about Taiwan. You know, that could that could do things. But if you just sort of stop us right now and say, are you more worried about inflation getting a little bit higher or about growth getting a little bit lower? I'm more worried about inflation than I am about growth. I actually feel pretty good about growth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to support the, the, your thesis, which is that we shouldn't have a deficit this big. Um, and, and just some numbers for sport. Uh, debt as a percent of GDP at the end of World War II was 106%. Debt as a percent of GDP in 2007 was 38%. Debt as a percent of GDP today is about 106%. So in the last 15 years, we've pretty much spent everything that our forefathers saved in the 60 years after World War II. 
Now, there's no particular reason why 106 is good or bad. I mean, Japan's at 200 and something. I don't really aspire to be Japan, but no one's calling their debts. And uh, Italy's at 180%. I definitely don't aspire to be Italy, but nobody's calling their debts either yet. Um, but you know, there's some point where you don't just go broke uh, gradually, you go broke suddenly, as Hemingway famously said. So, you know, we've got to think hard about it. And um, it's almost been a little bit easy to ignore it in a world where interest rates have been very close to zero. But if interest rates go up, you know, we're going to have to pay more attention to it. Um, you know, a couple, uh, a couple things. You know, when interest rates go up, uh, because the federal debt is financed on a, you know, 30-year, 10-year, 5-year, you know, it's not like they all go up immediately. There's a bunch of 10-year bonds that don't change at all. You're just paying the same 2% interest that you were paying whenever you issued it two years ago. And so it takes some time for that interest rate pressure to come into the federal uh, budget. When it does come into the federal budget, um, like with pension benefits in state and local governments, its effect is a crowding out effect. Now, there used to be a thing called bond vigilantes that, in, when I was growing up, that you know took on the federal government when they thought debt was out of order and all of a sudden interest rates would spike. We haven't seen them in 30 years. I don't know where they went. Maybe some of you used to be them or are. But uh, but the markets will discipline the federal at some point here. Then the good news is the Today Show did something in 2011. They had a, a table like this, and they had some flashcards, and they had one of every interest group. They had a Tea Party or and a student and a teacher and a retiree and a union member and a you know they had one of every every uh, part of America, and they but balanced the budget in 20 minutes. Um, so it's doable. It's just you just need will to do it. Yep. Sitting on the FOMC committee, you always hear anecdotes that whether it's ECB or CPI are unreliable. Do you look outside of you know government data sources for your inflation data? Well, so I, I was in business for 30 years. Uh, the first thing I thought when I started to look at the inflation data was that they didn't know what they were talking about. And so I dug into it, and you know, they're not bad. Um, they're not bad. We like PCE more than CPI because PCE dynamically adjusts. Um, and, and there are a couple of metrics we think are better in PCE, but you can look at whatever you want. They're, they're not bad. Uh, there's a guy named Boskin who's a professor who did a pretty interesting analysis of all this circa maybe 06 or 07. Um, and you know, they're not, they're not bad. If anything, maybe it's a little overstated. Uh, that's what I would say. If anything, maybe a little overstated, because some of the stuff like uh, technology enabled, the things you get for free on your phone, you know, that you used to pay for, like the news, right? They just sort of drop out of the basket rather than showing that you got it for free. But, you know, uh, they're not terrible. Uh, that said, they're late and they're revised. So my basic theory of economic insight is uh, every day I do two or three phone calls or meetings with executives in businesses that are of interest to me. I talked this morning to the head of a major home builder. I talked to a guy who sells mattresses and furniture. Uh, I was very in I'm very interested in what, hap what rates might do to the housing market. So I'm trying to get real insight on that. Um, and I'm trying to talk to price setters about how they're thinking about price going forward. Because, you know, the past is the past. And I'm not, uh, I could litigate the data, but there's probably not much point in that. The real issue is, you know, has this inflationary episode bled into the mindset of price setters? That's really the, the issue. And so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to sort that out. So my best data comes from humans, but I have to say, A, it's not really data, it's anecdotes, and B, it's massively sifted through my experience helping companies think about pricing. So I actually have a high discount factor on what people tell me, and I'm trying to get to you know, real indicators of whether they're doing things or thinking about things differently. Uh, I think that uh, there is increasingly a inflation's going to be around mindset that's spreading into the view of price setters. I think there's a consistent view that the people who have been limiting uh, people's courage to increase prices, whether they be intermediaries like the auto companies or Home Depot uh, or consumer elasticity, uh, they're not seeing the same kind of resistance that they used to, which means that they've got the courage to pass on prices that two years ago, if you talked to any of these things, they wouldn't have the courage to pass on prices. So that's kind of depressing if you care about inflation. 
On the other hand, one of the questions I ask is, okay, where do you think prices are gonna be in your segment two years from now? Nobody thinks they're gonna have two more years of inflation. So you have to put those two things together. Their today courage and pricing is quite high. Their tomorrow prospect is quite modulated. And I've sort of put those together and said, you know, it's time for us to wield our very slow, sluggish artillery into position to give them the confidence and reassurance that their views of two years from now are going to be what they think it is. Yeah. Uh, regarding future inflation. Sorry, you said future inflation? Future inflation. And the fact that um, with respect to residential rentals, that the majority of residential rental property, the rents have probably gone up in the neighborhood of 15%. And um, the, for the lower income people, modest income people, that could represent Well, so there are two sets of things kind of implied uh, in that. So I'll, I'll sort of jump around. Uh, you know, one is uh, we're definitely in a, uh, a housing price inflation period. Um, you know, I like to say, uh, you know, nothing convinces you uh, to think about your house more than spending 24 hours a day in it. And a lot of you and I have spent a lot of time in our houses. And so people are upgrading, and that includes where you live, but also furniture and patios and, uh, and paint and all the, all the rest of that stuff. Um, uh, because so many people are building and working on houses, and you could put the industrial construction in there too, um, we're seeing a real shortage, and so costs are going up significantly in that segment. And so you've got a ton more demand. People have prioritized house and their spending priorities. And you know, real constraints in supply, they're driving up pressures on price. Um, that may end up being an inflation issue. Um, I'm actually, where I hear it the most is workforce housing. Um, what we've got right now is a affordable housing model that is a subsidy stack where uh, different state and local government entities have found ways to put money behind construction of and renting of properties at below market rents. And um, increased costs are going to put pressure on that. But they adjust because the rent, you know, you get 60% of AMI. As AMI goes up, you know, the, the people will get more. So that subsidy stack has some natural adjustment to it and I think should work. But, you know, workforce, you know, teachers, firemen, um, there's no subsidy there. Uh, there's no structure for any subsidy there. And uh, developers aren't going to build a $250,000 house when you can build a $700,000 house and sell it for $900,000. And so um, I think that's going to be a real uh, shortage issue. I don't know how to think about it as an inflation issue because it's also true uh, that wages, uh, you know, when people look at average wage growth versus average price growth, they're, they're de -average, they need to de-average it. And so if you're in uh, construction or manufacturing or um, hospitality, you know, your wage growth isn't 5.1%, it's 18%, right? Um, if you're me, it's zero. So you put those two together. Of course, we manage inflation, so mine probably ought to be zero. But, um, and you put those together, and there's some weighted average that gets to 5.1%. So they're also getting very large wage gains. But, you know, the thing that's pernicious about inflation is, you know, when I get a wage gain, it's because I work hard and I'm a good employee. And when my prices go up, it's because the stupid Fed isn't controlling inflation. And I'm not whining, but that is a little bit how people think about it. But I think when you, when you look at how inflation hits a household, you've really got to de-average it. Yeah? You mentioned that the Fed added time to raise rates and to see improvements in uh, the inflation numbers. What does that timeline look like? So I think one of the concerns is the lack of equivalent at this point, and then energy prices, you know, those shocks still coming in, you know, how patient should they be, I guess, to see any improvement in what that looks like? <clears throat> Well, uh, here's how I think about it. We're still in the pandemic era, right? We're chips are not yet in cars, right? Chips are not in cars. We're in the pandemic uh, era. 
we've got all of the various shortage things that we've talked about, plus the stuff coming out of the Ukraine. So my hypothesis, which, you know, I've been wrong before, is there's some amount of normal pandemic era normalization that's going to take some of the heat out of the supply chain stuff, maybe even take some heat out of the labor market stuff, and help settle prices somewhat. Now, I don't believe that's going to settle prices completely on its own. Otherwise, I might not be arguing for the rate path that I'm arguing on. But I do think it's a force that's in the economy, the pandemic era pressures subsiding. And then I think we're moving our artillery uh, into position. I think that also has an impact, as I suggested, a lot of it immediately. You know, mortgage rates are already up. Short-term rates are already up. And then others over time, you know, as markets sort of align with our rate and, and we do what we do. And so I, I see both of those working together. And I don't know how to put a particular date on it, because to me, it, it really is this pandemic era thing. And so we might be done with the pandemic era. And so three or four months from now, you're putting chips in cars, and what's the challenge? But you know, there's a whole other virus in Western Europe. Who knows what happens uh, in April and May? So I'm, I'm a little reluctant to put a date on it. But, but the mindset is pandemic era. And, and maybe the marker would be chips in cars because that is such a big driver of what we've seen over the last year. And it, it's shocking, honestly, that we could have a chip shortage. I, I just, you know, it's just nothing I forecasted two years ago. Sorry, you've had your hand up, yeah. Uh, so as you look to remove the stimulus um, going forward, how, how do you think about the fiscal side and how much that has affected aggregate demand um, versus what the Fed has done with Well, so I think the fiscal side has definitely affected aggregate demand. And of course, it's the easiest to see. You know, those of you who track credit card data, you can see the day after a stimulus check comes out what happens to spending. Um, uh, you know, independent of uh, whether it was the only cause of labor force participation, there's no question that extra wealth in people's pockets had some amount of uh, negative impact on return uh, to the workforce. So. I mean, I think you can see the impact of fiscal stimulus. And that, like I said, we're going to see even more um, because there's still this $2 trillion plus in people's pockets not yet spent. There's still this money on state and local uh, balance sheets. Um, you know, on the monetary policy side, uh, you know, we took rates down. I think we should have, you know, in March 2020. Uh, we were facing a cliff, and it seemed uh, useful to use all those tools. And I think it had a effect on demand for cars, for demand for houses and the like. But I don't know that its effect, I mean, obviously we don't affect supply. And so in a world where supply was short eventually, you know, how much did it matter that we we're pushing demand? It probably didn't, right? Other than maybe that create a little extra verve to take prices up, which would be unfortunate. Um, you know, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm a little bit more skeptical than some others on the QE path. I think the first six months of it, which was restore markets, was an unfortunate necessity. Um, you know, you, you couldn't have the Treasury market fail in March of 2020. Um, but the part after that, I think it's a very legitimate question whether we needed to be doing it with 2020 hindsight. I'm much better, by the way, with 2020 hindsight. Uh, yeah? How, how does the economic data and outlook for the state of Virginia compare to other states in the fifth district and then Virginia looks very good. I mean, uh, unemployment is very low. The, the Virginia issue is population growth. And so the thing that's really fascinating uh, about um, you know, Virginia, as a guy who moved here four years ago, is this is a hell of a great place. But in South Carolina, the population grows 2% a year. And in North Carolina, the population grows 2% a year. In Virginia, the population doesn't grow. Like, why? Uh, there's, you know, the tax rates are the same. You can't do that thing. The living is good. You know, I think a huge part of it is a northern Virginia churn factor. There's a little bit of it that's a small town Virginia departure factor. But, you know, there's something pretty important if you want to grow an economy that needs to happen here, which is growing the workforce and growing the, the population. And actually, there's a lot of in-migration, but a lot of out-migration. And, uh, and the South Carolina, North Carolina stories, which are, of course, in my district and right next door, I think are quite compelling. Uh, in the back left. All right, thank you. Um, you mentioned the Treasury curve, how many people have, it, it's tough really in terms of what they can tell you. Could you talk a little bit about FIPS? You mentioned the 10-year break even. Um, it just seems like there's so much retail money in PIC. Do you put a lot of validity there as, you know, an indicative measurement of what's going 
Yeah, you know, I'm tortured on that topic. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a market for tips. You can do some fancy math and figure out what the tips are telling you in terms of break-even inflation rates. Uh, my colleagues like not just to look at the 10-year tips, which right now I think is 298, or the five-year tips, which right now are 363. Both of those, to me, are unacceptable against a 2% target. Um, and they like to look at the 5.5, five, which I think if you back that as about 2.3, right? In other words, after five years of 3.6, to get to 10 years of 2.98, you have to have five years of 2.3. That was done in my head, but I think it's not far off. Um, and so what do you take out of that? And then, you know, you're going to tell me a couple things which are totally legitimate, which is that market's not nearly as liquid as a lot of other markets. So you're comparing a not that liquid tip market to a very liquid treasury market and making some conclusions. The second is it works off the CPI, not the PCE, and it doesn't work off the core, it works off the headline. And so oil prices matter as does the CPI. So it's, there's a lot of funky stuff going on in it. You know, on the other hand, if all of a sudden it took off and markets were telling us they think inflation, you know, after this episode is going to be three, four, five percent, I think you'd have to pay attention to it. So, you know, I pay attention to it not as a, uh, not as a driver of uh, my thinking, but as a helpful confirmatory point in my thinking. That's that's how I think about it. Put differently, if you wait for inflation expectations to unanchor before moving, then you'll lose because you can't re-anchor them nearly as quickly as you can unanchor them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're definitely benefited by being the reserve currency, uh, including our economy being less buffeted by, you know, every other economy in the world has to worry about what the Fed does. We're the only economy that really doesn't spend any time thinking about what other banks do, because everything's done in dollars. It doesn't matter uh, to us. Um, obviously, we've talked about the 10-year being low. A lot of that is because we're the reserve's currency and people find it a stable source of value. Um, there's no question in my mind that we've weaponized our status as the reserve currency. And we've weaponized it in Russia, but um, when I was at McKinsey five years ago, we weaponized it in Iran. And I can tell you that the Europeans did not like that. Right? If you're Siemens trying to sell stuff to Iran, and that is what Siemens wanted to do, to have the U.S. government say you can't do that right, was uh, a pretty aggressive act. And... Um, and the European, uh, Mark Carney gave a speech, which has been documented at Jackson Hole about four years ago. Um, the, the, forget the Chinese and the Russians. The Europeans don't really like the fact that we can weaponize uh, our currency to support whatever sanctions we choose to put on whatever country uh, we choose to do. So, you know, when you have a, a lot of leverage and you use the leverage, it's hard to use it again. But I'm not so worried about uh, the great benefit we have is, like, where else would you go? I mean, you know, the, the franc is too low. I mean, I mean, too illiquid the, uh, or too small. It's not traded uh, large enough lots. The, um, the euro is not really uh, that credible. I don't think you want the yen or the yuan. So it's not clear we have a competitor uh, right now. But there's no question that, um, that the European, not just the Russians and the Chinese, but the Europeans would like to have a competitor. Yeah? So somewhat related to that, do you think we'll ever have a digital dollar someday? We already have a digital dollar. I've got $50 in my pocket, and I've got more than that in the bank. And I pay all my bills digitally. So we have a digital dollar. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, us having a digital dollar, a Fed-issued digital dollar. Uh, we put out a paper on that in uh, January, and um, uh, the president has sort of authorized a working group to work on what we might want to do with that. I think the challenge you get to is what are you trying to accomplish? And that's where it's really quite unclear, right? Um, there's some people who think the reason to have a digital dollar is so that everyone could have an account and we're not dependent on banks anymore. But of course, the banking system adds a lot of value to this country. And so you have to be very careful about creating a mechanism which could lead to a run on the banks into the digital system. And so one thing that paper says is 
we'd only do it through the banks as a tokenized device like cash, you know, through a banking distribution channel. But some people really want an accounts for all kind of notion. Other people think the Chinese are introducing a digital thing and so we've got to do it. But of course, you know, those people who think the Chinese are a threat uh, forget that the Chinese want to do this in part because they like having uh, transparency into every transaction done in China. And I don't think our population is excited about having every transaction reviewed in the US. So uh, some people talk about uh, trans-border payments, you know, being a use case. And, and I'll suggest that trans-border payments are inefficient. It's not obvious you have to introduce this whole thing to fix it, but that's uh, a question. Um, uh, I think we've got lots of illicit transactions that are enabled by alternative currencies. But of course, we should be able to regulate um, that. The, the best case that I've heard for a digital, for a central bank issued digital dollar is what I'll call the wildcat currency case, which is that if the world decides it's going to be transacting this way, then it'd be crazy for us not to offer that option. Um, in the same way that in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, you had all these states issuing currencies, and eventually the federal government said, why don't we just issue a U.S. dollar? And then I would just remind you that after that dollar was introduced, pretty much all those state currencies became worthless because everyone wanted the full faith and credit of the U.S. government versus, you know, um, Kansas or whatever other state you wanted to go for. So we could do it. The best case I've heard is if the world wants to transact that way, we ought to do it. We've put in place the research we need to to be able to do it if we need to do it, want to do it. And I think we're just trying to get together on whether it makes sense or not. Yeah? On a related note, uh, Jay Powell was known as a huge bubble fighter, I think. A right bubble a from, bubble fighter? Yeah, but he didn't like bubbles and he would use, when he came in to the, the Fed chair, he was, I don't know if that's true or not, but he would you know, crush any bubbles, whereas Ben Bernanke let them run. Oh, I see, okay, uh, acid bubbles, sorry. Acid bubbles, yes. No, it didn't. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very cheery place, the Fed, but it's not all, <laughs> it's not all champagne. It's not all champagne. Yeah, that's good to know that you're serious. Um, but you've had this kind of acid bubble in crypto for, you know, raging for a while. Uh, what, what are the thoughts of the Fed in terms of regulating crypto and so forth? We know many of you are better investment advisors than I will ever be, so I won't advise you on whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, other than to say, you know, there's crypto as a currency and there's crypto as an asset class. And crypto as a currency, I think we just talked about, if it became widely spread, I think, you know, the risk to that would be that the Fed introduced a competing currency. Um, crypto as an asset class is it's an uncorrelated, presumably uncorrelated, maybe it's not, you know, asset class in a time where there don't seem to be a lot of great asset classes, but, um, and it's like gold or fine art or whatever, but I don't know. I mean, if fine art's worthless because no one else wants to buy it, I think I'm just going to put it on the wall. I don't know what I'm going to do with my crypto if I don't have any crypto, but if I had a crypto, you know, if, if the world decides it's worthless. So that, you know, I think it's got to get regulated. Um, and it's got to get regulated because of illicit transactions. I mean, we have a whole regime, the anti-money laundering regime here, that says you can't send more than $10,000 in cash, and that's for all kinds of reasons related to uh, drug deals, uh, you know, uh, uh, sales to foreign arms uh, dealers, um, money to Russia, right? And so it's going to have to end up one way or the other. That's part of the review that the president's uh, put folks on, is how does it get regulated? But I have to imagine that piece of it's going to get regulated. Okay. I, I yeah. More. I, I was on a call yesterday where the economics team, um, they, they're forecasting a recession in Europe um, this year, mm -hmm. like later this year, early next year. Um, do you see any potential um, recession in Europe? And if so, how do y'all factor in contagion um, in the FOM season? Well, I mean, I mean, Europe is a lot more exposed to this whole Russia-Ukrainian thing than we are. I think it's very easy to imagine a recession in Europe. Um, the Dallas Fed did a did a, a paper yesterday on, you know, a, a oil sanctions from Europe to Russia would cause a recession in Europe. So it's not it's not hard to imagine it, whether it happens or not. You know, we'll see, but it's not hard to imagine it. Um, you know, question one is what happens to the financial system when that happens. You know, we were all nervous back in the 2010s about contagion coming from the European financial 
situation. So far, that doesn't seem to be a big issue, but that's obviously something uh, you'd look at. And, you know, Europe demand, you know, is going to matter to us, but it's kind of in the half point of GDP range, that risk. It's not in the three points of GDP range. I mean, the, the thing about the U.S., this is also true of China, is we're still an 80 percent, you know, domestic manufacturer, domestic consumption kind of country, right? And so we do have trade in the 18 to 20 percent range. That's different than, you know, the U.K., which is, you know, totally on the other side of this. And so what happens here is really still by far the most important thing to us, unless you've got these kind of financial contagions, which get into, you know, if our banks had a lot of exposure to the UK, you know, those sorts of things. So I, it matters. It would matter. I kind of put it in that kind of range of GDP, which could matter. But, uh, but the, we got to take care of ourselves. I think that's the most important thing. Okay. Going, going. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you for what uh, you do and for having me here. It's fun to see you. And Tom, as a token of our appreciation, we have a, a gift for you, so thank you. All righty. Um, so our, our next meeting should be April the 13th in, in person. We're still uh, finalizing the details, but uh, put it on your calendar, April the 13th. So. Thank you all for coming today.